You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. I can't remember the first time I saw it. I had to be pretty young because I know my parents were driving the car. You see it, and you're instantly confused. A cemetery? Here? It looks like it's floating in a sea of highways. Just this little patch of grass and tombstones, completely surrounded by lanes, filled with tiny cars and big trucks. I've passed it countless times in my life, and I wondered about it. But I just kept driving. Then one day, I decided to stop and find out why it was there. And what I found was a group of people who care about cemeteries more than I care about most things in my life. They love them. And from talking to them, I started to care about cemeteries too. Okay, now I'm not going to say I love cemeteries, but now whenever I pass one, I think about all of these people and the work that they're doing. I also just have this weird appreciation for them. These people change the way I think about cemeteries, but also how I think about death. But I would have missed it if I kept driving. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of the cemetery in the middle of highways and what it can teach us about the future of our cemeteries. I'm Stephanie Phillips, and this is Paradigm. Allow me to show you something. This is your chance to stop driving. Not literally, but stick with me. I'm going to introduce you to people you haven't met and places you've never been. Their stories can take us into some of the most important issues in our society. And this is your opportunity to finally listen. On the surface, these might seem like small stories, but we're going to show you how they can have a big impact. And I hope it will shift the way you think. Now, let's go visit that cemetery. Okay, so I'm standing in the middle of the Richview Memorial Cemetery. It's a small piece of land in present-day Toronto, and the land it sits on is filled with a deep history. But you wouldn't know it if you saw it, if you ever did see it. Most people whiz by the cemetery in their cars on the way into or out of Toronto. If you blink, you could easily miss it. It sits in the middle of the highway interchange of two of North America's busiest highways, Ontario 401 and 427. It's where the cemetery sits, that the arms of these two highways twist and wind around each other. You might think it actually looks like the highway was designed to move perfectly around the cemetery. And you would be right. Before highways came, the cemetery sat on the land of a church, surrounded by farmland. The first person was buried there in 1846. That's 174 years ago. And many of the area's earliest settlers followed. Over time, the farmers sold their land and moved north. New houses were built, and an airport moved into the area. By that time, the two-lane highways that were once sufficient became too small, so they decided to expand. When those plans for the highway expansion were being drawn up, the church decided to relocate to a quiet street nearby. But a group of local people, some with ancestors buried at the cemetery, refused to let the bodies be moved. Randall Reed's grandfather was one of those people. And so why was the decision made to leave the cemetery and it's a- well, it was there first, so if you're there first, you're going to have to go around it. <laughs> Is that the... That was, that was basically it. How did the board come to that decision, or the city? Well, we were there first, so if you want to build a highway, you're going to have to go around it. <laughs> All of the people on that initial team, including Randall's grandfather, have since died. 
Randall came into the picture years later. He first became interested because of the family connection. Some of Randall's ancestors on his mother's side are buried in the cemetery. But he stuck around because he genuinely enjoys local history and genealogy. Today, Randall is the last person left to protect and defend the cemetery from the threats of urban sprawl. But currently, there's really not enough money to maintain it, so that it's maintained. The additional sum comes from donations. Okay. Local donations, or? From me. (laughs) (laughs) So how did that kind of responsibility land on you? Well, I was the last one. There wasn't anybody else, so I ended up with it. Randall is a retired civil servant. When we met, he was wearing a gold watch with the City of Toronto emblem on the face. He spent most of his career working at a museum in Toronto and volunteering with the local historical society. He doesn't look threatening, but he's a fearless defender when it comes to the future of this cemetery and others like it. He's part of a group of people who are known as family historians. You probably have one in your family. I know there's one in mine. They're the ones who spend weird amounts of time on Ancestry.ca or FamilySearch.org. For Randall, this work has gone beyond just collecting and documenting. He tells me it's about preservation. And in this case, he's preserving the resting places of those who came before us. But he's also actively seeking them out. See, Randall has been working with local groups to locate known burial sites and register them with the province. It's a thing some of them call cemetery hunting. You put on some long pants, drive out into the middle of nowhere, and you start looking for tombstones. More on that later. But the point is, they do it because not every cemetery has a Randall, someone to look after and protect it. As urban sprawl engulfs places that were once rural, existing cemeteries get swallowed up by subdivisions and highways. They're often left out, forgotten, or overlooked in city planning. And because of it, we're running out of burial space. Through strength and a bit of stubbornness, Richview has defied the odds. It's managed to fend off developers and stake its place in the modern world. But will our cemeteries be as lucky? Will the cemetery my parents are eventually buried in, or the one that I choose, have the strength to move highways? Will burial even be an option by then? I wanted to know how cemeteries fit into our future. But first, I needed to understand how cemeteries from the past have managed to survive until now. That's when I heard about the Warners Family Cemetery and two guys who are fighting to protect it. Yeah. Yeah. Is good. Yes. So I guess, can you guys tell me where we are? We are at Warner's Family Cemetery here in Niagara-on-the-Lake on Warner's Road, just off the QEW going Niagara Falls bound. The Warner's Family Cemetery is right in the heart of wine country. It's a small cemetery. Only a few hundred people are buried there. And on its western boundary is the Queen Elizabeth Way, another one of Ontario's major highways. The only thing blocking the cemetery from the highway is a tall chain-linked fence. I drove out here to meet Steve Fulton, whom you just heard, and Joe Wilson. They're two cousins with an affinity for the dead. I asked Joe to tell me more about the cemetery. This was one of the first Methodist cemeteries in Canada well, before Canada, Upper Canada at the time. Christian Warner, the namesake of the cemetery, he built a church, actually, probably right where the highway is right now. Five years after he built the church, he built the cemetery, and it was a cornerstone of the community for roughly 70 years. Christian Warner is Steve's great-grandfather, seven times removed, and Joe's sixth. Steve's older, but as they explained to me, Joe has more seniority. After Steve joined the group that oversees the cemetery, 
He convinced Joe to join as well. But it wasn't a difficult sell. Joe tells me he's been walking cemeteries for 45 years, since he was 14. And Warners, well, it's about family for them. You know, as the Golden Horseshoe started to grow, and people from t- Toronto and surrounding areas started to realize that Niagara wasn't that far away. You know, the wineries really started to make a push forward in Niagara on the lake. Tourism, uh, you know, made that real push. And, uh, you know, it just continued to grow. And, you know, the QEW is a major artery into the United States and back in. So uh, it was just natural. And now we're going to... Just like at Richview, when the government wanted to expand the highway, they first consulted with the community. They could expand to the west, where a rare species of newt lived. Or they could expand to the east, where Warner sits they decided to expand east. So environmentalists won out over the dead people. (laughs) I'm glad you guys can laugh about it now. (laughs) Well, there's nothing you can do. It's, as I said, it's urban sprawl. And so the highway took about 130 feet from the cemetery, pushing its western boundary up to the grave of one Mary Jane. But this isn't the only battle they've waged in the name of protecting cemeteries. Like Randall, they've spent years helping the province track down lost cemeteries. They're actually the ones who came up with the nickname cemetery hunting. It's a cool process. Joe takes old maps from the 1800s and overlays them on present day ones. They pinpoint the location of a cemetery from the old map on the new one and drive out to it. And when they find them, they pour blood, sweat, and tears into defending them from development. We're always looking for cemeteries. Yeah, I can't drive down the road and not stop if I see a cemetery. And Joe will use a technology, Google Maps, and he'll overlay it over old 1860 maps, the county atlas maps, which are very well indexed. They show where churches and cemeteries are and stuff like that. Well, now with when you overlay it, all of a sudden, that church or that cemetery is now in the middle of a parking lot or may be in a farmer's field that's been lost over the generation. It's not that it's, it's discovering it, it's rediscovering it. The first step in protecting a cemetery is making sure people know about it. And to do that, you have to register it. The unregistered cemeteries can literally be plowed over and uh, dug up, and if they're not registered, urban sprawl like this subdivision could easily trample over them and they'd be evaporated. Say, for example, you're a developer and you just bought this nice piece of land where you want to build a bunch of pretty houses. Okay, cool. You go through the city and you get all of your permits. Check, 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 everything looks good. But when you go to break ground, right where your beautiful new community is supposed to go, There's a bunch of old and broken tombstones on the ground. Or maybe there weren't any stones at all. Often, these sites are only discovered after human remains turn up in the bucket of an excavator. Because it's not registered, the city didn't know about it. And by default, that means you didn't know about it either. Now, the law says you're supposed to call authorities when you find human remains. But do you? Either way, the graves end up disturbed or destroyed. Being registered means a cemetery is protected under existing and future legislation. In Ontario, there are an estimated 66,000 known burial sites or cemeteries. That's according to the Ontario Genealogical Society, a nonprofit organization dedicated to family history. Steve is the president and Joe is chair of the cemetery committee there. The society estimates that 20% of the known burial sites in the province are unregistered, and new ones are discovered regularly. As communities grow, as people from Toronto or surrounding neighborhoods come into Niagara, you know, these folks are we're laid here to rest, and we want to make sure that they're protected, because who's going to do it when, we're, when it's our turn to be laid to rest? Steve and Joe wanted to take me to a cemetery in the region that's benefited from this designation. Oh. 
we drove a few minutes from Warner's and ended up at the Willick Family Cemetery. It's another small cemetery, again, with only a few hundred people buried in it. And when you pull up, the first thing you notice is this big black fence around the border. And just outside of it is a new subdivision. When they decided to develop the area, they put up a fence to protect the cemetery. But when Steve and Joe went to check out the new fence for the first time, something was off. We had actually found, the, there's just a wee little stone off to my side here. Uh, that's just a little boy's headstone. And when I came, I found the stone on the other side of the fence. Turns out, the fence, it was in the wrong spot. They had brought the fence actually into the cemetery and placed it on top of some burial locations. Uh, it wasn't through old maps and realizing that they had the fence in the wrong location, that the city was kind enough to take out the fence and then relocate it 10 feet to the south just to make sure that it wasn't encroaching on any burial. Child or adult, it doesn't make any difference. They need, they're buried here. They need to be on the right side of the fence. So when urban sprawl happens, the remains aren't disturbed or aren't destroyed. So is that why the fence was in, important to you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The fence would delineate the cemetery for years. So if they wanted to put a sidewalk in, they know which where they can put the sidewalk, where they can put the gas, where they can put the water lines. Because mm-hmm. you don't want to being drilled through an existing burial site. That's just not cool. It's important because, to them, cemeteries are about more than just the birth and death date of the people there. Uh, Being a family historian, being a family detective, is more than just the birth and death date, okay? It's great to know when they were born or married or had children or died. That's great, but it's that dash on the headstone that represents their life, where they worked, where they played, where they cared for their families. You know, that's what's important. And we should honor them. And by honoring them is by protecting them in their final resting place. Not only is it a passion, it also adds a little bit of excitement and adventure to their lives. When does this, when do these hunts happen? Anytime when we have time or we're just tired of dealing with the living and just want to go deal with the dead. Yeah, sometimes you just got to say, you know, I got to get out and get away from people. So we go looking for dead people. Yes, they seem to be grouped in the same place all the time. It's good. They don't move around. You find one, you find a bunch. Yeah, they don't talk back. (laughs) And we've marched through uh, a kilometer of cornfield to get back to a cemetery. We, you know, they're just anywhere and everywhere. And it's getting out there and checking on them. And, you know, getting boots on the ground out there to say, yeah, we've been in this cemetery um, in the last couple of years, but there's over 300, Joe was saying, in Niagara, it's kind of hard to get to all of them because it really, it really sucks in the winter. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you kind of got limited hunting season as you... <laughs> when I met Steve and Joe, it was a hot day at the beginning of July. And aside from the heat, it was a perfect day for cemetery hunting. So I convinced them to take me on one of their hunts. The beginning of our podcast is going to be, if there's two guys that should be certified and locked up, these are the two of them right here. (laughs) Here's the gold standard for nuts. (laughs) So what is this cemetery that we're um, we're going to go see? Gonder. Gonder. We don't know much about the cemetery or the people who are buried there. But that's because it's been hidden in the depths of a forest near the border between Niagara and Fort Erie. What we do know is that at one time, it was at the back of someone's property, sitting on the bank of a small creek. Steve and Joe guess that the earliest burial was in 1820. Okay. We drove out to a dirt road and parked the car. Then we started walking along the edge of the forest. You might hear me laugh nervously throughout this next little bit. It's because of what Steve was carrying. This machete actually came with my back with my wife and daughter from El Salvador. Oh, they went on a trip out there? We went on a missions trip and they brought back machetes. Twelve bucks. Wow, that's pretty handy. Yep. Did it come in that uh, leather It case? still wasn't making sense Everybody exactly why we needed a machete. 
But I was in too deep to turn back now. A few hundred meters later, and Joe had found our entry point. There we go. Here. All right. Huh? You have the weapons. <laughs> <laughs> Let the, the guy with the machete go first. Okay, hang on. I enjoy hiking, so this is not too bad. Although, usually there is a bit more of a trail. This was not the groomed paths this city girl was used to. No, we were walking into a wall of trees. I decided to just trust Steve and Joe and follow them in. So mom, if you're listening, you should just stop. You are not gonna like this. So at what point do you kind of just give up? Never. Never? Usually when it gets dark. Okay, that's fair. Yep. So there was this girl from Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> who went out into the woods. And these two guys. Yeah. Are you going, Steve, or what? At this point in the hunt, a little voice inside my head was whispering, But then, Joe saw something. Oh, Steve, right here. Got it. You found it? There we were, in the middle of a forest. And in front of us was an old farm gate. Oh, is that a gate? Yep. (gasps) Whoa. It looked like a gateway to nothing, just more trees and overgrown bush. But Steve knew there were graves out there, and he was determined to show me. This is freaking awesome. This is what I've needed for months. (laughs) (laughs) Machetes are good for taking out frustration. I guess, yeah. Sure enough, a few feet forward and a few hacks later, there was a large tombstone standing up towards the sun. And above it was an opening in the trees, giving us a clear view of the blue sky up above. On the ground, there were other broken stones. This yeah. is it. This is, we, can't, we can't explain it any better than this. You had to experience this. And for those who couldn't experience it, it's... Uh, just think it's like the Amazon, just trekking through the bush. Knowing there's a cemetery at point B, you just, just got to figure out there. the path of where B is sometimes. Because sometimes we don't even know. This particular one we knew. We were GPSed. But some of them, we have no clue. So we have to rely on old maps and, old, and then a lot of detective work. Yeah. Really, it is. Fits into that family detective Thing. Yeah, this is insane. It all comes back to that family historian, or as Steve says, that family detective thing. But this wasn't the first time Steve and Joe had been to Gonder. They had been before and were in conversation with the municipality to have a path built out to the cemetery and the grounds maintained. But that hasn't happened yet. When a cemetery is found, it can start on the path to becoming registered. But it's a laborious process that can take years. If it does become registered, that still doesn't exactly solve the problem. Someone still has to pay to operate it, or, at the very minimum, maintain it. And unsurprisingly, people aren't jumping to volunteer, because, well, that costs money. If a cemetery is on municipal land, the municipality is supposed to operate it. But cemeteries don't pay property taxes. 
and if it's on private land, the city is still supposed to take care of it. But most landowners fear that having a cemetery on their property will affect their resale value. And so we're left with a game of hacky sack, this ball of responsibility going round and round, jumping from one foot to another. So I had my answer. The old cemeteries are being protected by a bunch of grassroots family historians. But I wanted to know, how does their work fit into a future with more development and growing cities? What do they want out of this whole thing? Our work fits into that future just by preserving the memory of those who are in that cemetery. We understand progress happens. Yeah. You know, we understand, oh, we've got to put a highway in here, right? Right. In the middle of a big city. So, okay, let's get in there. Let's document it. Let's preserve it. Let's make it available for future generations of the families who are buried there. Mm -hmm. When it comes to a rural area like Niagara, we can move a highway a little bit this way or a little bit that way. To, to preserve the cemetery. There's no need to move it. Just uh, just to cap what Joe was saying, one, existing cemeteries like this particular one, make sure it's in your plans. And then cities of Toronto and, you know, bigger cities and stuff, when you're developing roads, make sure those cemeteries are already in your plan. So future cemeteries. So, okay, we're going to run out of room at this cemetery. We need to build another one. Let's get it into the planning department. Let's already get it planned so not 20 years down the road. you got to rip everybody back out and move them again. Because at one time, maybe there, some mom and dad buried their little one because he got sick or, you know, whatever. And they figured that would be their final resting place and they would be buried with their child forever. Right. Well, all of a sudden, now city sprawl, urban sprawl, they're all being ripped out of the ground. Let's try to respect their wishes. Even though they're gone, they still they have a reason why they're buried there. Let's honor that reason. So now the challenge is, it's your job to get us out. Yeah. That was the test. Oh, oh, we, oh, we won't be getting out if it's my job to get us out. <laughs> Paradigm will be right back after this quick break. I left Stephen Joe and drove back to Toronto, where I kept thinking about one of the last things they said that they just want people to start planning with cemeteries in mind. And if they're taking care of our historical cemeteries, who's taking care of our modern ones? Around that same time, I came across the work of Nicole Hansen. Nicole is an environmental planner who has spent her career advocating for cemeteries to be at the forefront of urban planning. It's a thing she calls cemetery urbanism. Talking about cemeteries as a part of everyday life so that we can create communities that emulate a complete life cycle. Places where we can live, work, play, and die. I met her at the Christchurch Memorial Garden in the west end of Toronto. It's not far from my childhood home, where my parents still live today. I remember when there was an old church on the property. It burned down, and the land it sat on was transformed into this garden that it is now. Today, the cemetery is surrounded by coffee shops, grocery stores, housing, and transit. When people walk through on their way to work or the store, they're met with a beautiful pergola in the center. It's surrounded by flower beds and draped with vines. I sat down with Nicole on one of the benches spaced throughout. This is the new paradigm for what urban cemeteries can look like. It has a bit of that old pastoral garden cemetery feel, older aged headstones, Um, made of granite and limestone. There's a historic and heritage component to the cemetery that you can see, but also there's some really strong elements of urban design. Just in the time Nicole and I were sitting there, 
we saw people use the space as a throughway. There was a woman sitting and enjoying a coffee. We heard trains, buses, and emergency vehicles drive by. It's a rarity for a cemetery to function in so many ways. And to understand why that is, we have to look at the history of cemetery development. In his book, The Toronto Book of the Dead, historian Adam Bunch writes that the Wendat people, who are original to the area north of Lake Ontario, used to bury their peoples in deep communal graves, all together with members of multiple communities, surrounded by furs and prized possessions. Often, there wouldn't be any marking on top of the grave. This makes these burial grounds even more susceptible to being disturbed or destroyed by development. When white settlers came to Canada, they brought with them burial traditions of Europe. At first, funerals took place in the home and families laid their loved ones on their properties or on the bank of a river. Then, as communities grew, they started burying each other on the grounds of local churches. At the time, these were often non-denominational, meaning they were places of worship for different religions to pray and socialize under one roof. But these spaces were quickly filling up. By the early 19th century, churches started to restrict burials to members of the congregation. At the same time, yellow fever, typhoid, and cholera were rampant. Bodies were left in shallow graves and crowded together, causing health concerns. The grounds were often vandalized, filled with stray dogs, and left unattended. Out of a need for more space and a desire for something a little more sophisticated, the rural cemetery was born. These are the sprawling cemeteries that aren't restricted to any one religion, where graves seem to go on for eternity. And that's because they kind of do. In Canada, we're buried in perpetuity. That means you and the people who are legally entitled to your property after you die, that's your partner, your kids, your siblings, they own the rights to the plot literally forever. They don't own the land, but that little space in the ground where your body goes, you're entitled to that Forever. Forever. These cemeteries were built outside of town, away from urban life, as a place for city dwellers to escape to, kind of like a big park, where the living and the dead can coexist, if only for a short visit. As time went on and demographics changed, columbaria and mausoleums were introduced to accommodate burial needs of the population. Cemeteries became big business, offering a one-stop shop for all things death. From the death certificate with the city, to the funeral arrangements, to the burial. Cities grew, land became a hot commodity, and these rural cemeteries became surrounded by industry and residential neighborhoods, leaving them no space to expand to further meet burial needs of the population. They were kind of left behind as being those spaces that we bury our dead and it's outside, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, Those are places we don't go. Even if we're looking at them now, they're almost out of place. It's like, oh, there's a cemetery right in the middle of a highway. Or there's a cemetery right between those two condos. You know, it's, it's because of how they were previously positioned as being outside of the city, where now we need them. I wondered if maybe part of it was like, we don't like to, as a society, you don't like to talk about death. Yeah, absolutely. I think in the most basic, straightforward answer, people don't want to deal with it. People don't want a crematorium in their backyard. Right. They don't want to see a procession. It's bad luck. It's bad, ju- it's bad juju. Like it's, it's this whole response about not wanting to realize our mortality and understand that death is, is normal. So people don't want to see it. It's out of mind. It needs to be far away. There's that cultural persona that death is bad and that, you know, we have to be fearful. Nicole's research estimates that within 15 to 20 years, cemeteries in Toronto and the greater Toronto area will run out of space. For some cemeteries, that number is even lower. The deadline could come as early as 10 years. 
people don't have enough space to be buried. And uh, if we're out of space, we have to do infill. Infill is when cemeteries start to bury people in spaces that were originally left free of any burials. They might remove a path to squeeze more people in or start burying between existing graves. And people don't like that. I've heard complaints where a man said, I came in to visit my wife and there was a path right by her grave and I can't walk by there anymore and stop and put flowers down because there's no path. I have to walk through all the people to get to her and it's unfortunate. Nicole says the responsibility is on the municipalities. They need to do their due diligence and take inventory so we don't run into people in Toronto not having a place to be buried. Because if that's the case and, that's, and that keeps coming up, it's going to be a very, very difficult time for the city. The way Nicole sees it, three main problems led us here. One, we don't force builders to plan and account for death when they develop an area. Nicole proposes that we ask them to account for cemetery space the same way we do for park space, transit, and schools. Two, most of our provincial planning policy in Canada doesn't address cemeteries in their master plans or visions. Again, the same way we do for waterfronts and communities. And finally, number three, we're not thinking about demographics, mortality rates, and cultural needs. Death is an equity issue. A lot of people can't afford to be buried in Toronto. And a lot of people still need full body burial. We're dealing with baby boomers right now, an aging population and COVID-19. Right. And it's taking over our most vulnerable population, seniors. People say, well, we can all cremate. Tell that to someone who's a practicing Muslim. It's blasphemous. We can't say that. People can't assume that cremation is a one size fits all. There are very specific religious and cultural needs for Orthodox Christians, for different Catholics, for Pentecostals, Presbyterians, Hindus, Jewish communities. They all have their the variations as to what their desires are in death and what their values are and, and how they can be buried and, and, or how they can be cremated. There's a way and there's a presentation as to who gets remembered and how. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people want a flat marker in the ground. People want, some people want vast, large marble monuments and lions and angels and bears. Like they want this whole performance. Mm -hmm. And that comes with class. So we see how class is intersected in these spaces. And also how people who, are, who don't have the means don't get represented in the same way. Yeah. People are complaining about the price. If you go to a cemetery right now and ask them for their price list for a full body burial, honey, it ain't cheap. <laughs> <laughs> On average, the price of a burial in Canada is between $5,000 and $10,000. Cremation is considerably less. It can cost between $2,000 to $5,000. If you want to scatter your remains, most cemeteries charge a scattering fee. And if you're thinking oh, I just want to be scattered somewhere in nature. Well, that might not be legal. Each municipality has regulations on where you can and can't scatter remains. Speaking? I was curious, so I called a cemetery near my home in Toronto. To know how much it would be for a full body burial at the... The agent on the line gave me a very concise breakdown. For a full-body burial plot, it will cost $16,000. That's not including burial fees, a monument, or a vault that you can purchase to prevent the ground from caving in around your casket. It doesn't include the casket either, or the cost of a funeral service. It's also worth mentioning that some provinces and municipalities will cover the cost of funeral arrangements in the event that family members or the deceased can't pay for it. But often, these arrangements don't cover everything that's needed or wanted by the family. Because of these high costs, Nicole is seeing a pattern she compares to leapfrogging. People who live in the city are forced to look to the suburbs 
for affordable burial plots, which then forces people in the suburbs to look in rural areas, and so on. It makes it harder for people to visit their loved ones and easier for all of us to forget about death. It's expensive for the working class. It's expensive for the middle class. It's it's expensive. And the same problems are echoed throughout Canada, in cities across the country. But we're not the only ones with this problem. Places around the world are struggling to find ways to deal with the dead. In Singapore, there's only one cemetery open for burials in the whole country. The city-state is smaller than New York City. And being a small state with limited space, they've adopted term burials, or grave recycling, as it's also known. Using term burials is basically renting or leasing your burial plot for an agreed amount of time. In Singapore, it's a maximum of 15 years. That time is supposed to be enough for your body to decompose. After that, your remains are exhumed, placed in a columbarium, and the plot is offered to someone else. Most countries in Europe have also adopted term burials. In Paris, they opened a cemetery offering green burials. For a green burial, remains don't go through the embalming process. They're laid in coffins or urns made of degradable materials, and they're wearing clothes made of natural fibers. Canada opened its first green burial site in BC in 2008. And since then, other sites have sprung up across the country. But it's still not a popular option. And we don't have term burials. However, our cremation rates are rising. Generally, though, there's a sentiment that because we are such a large country, we have endless space for burials. I heard that from Steve, Joe, Randall, and other people I spoke to. Nicole has heard it before, too. That sentiment doesn't take into consideration the urban needs and rural needs of communities to actually have designated areas to to be interred. They think about rolling hills and mountains and, and yeah, we have places to put people. No, to be, to be interred in a cemetery is to be in a designated, licensed, operating place. If your remains are anywhere else, it's considered a homicide. So yeah. you need to be in a cemetery and there's a way for them to be licensed, for them to be managed, for them to be operated. And there's only so many that can do that. What Nicole is saying here is that we have cemeteries for a reason. If human remains are found anywhere other than a cemetery, the police have to investigate it as they would a homicide. We need cemeteries because we need a place to go when we die. And with now a lot of churches, their volunteer boards are getting smaller and smaller. And their congregations are aging. People are no longer having the time to to come in and cut the grass and hire someone, they're not getting the funds. Right. So they're, the municipality is assuming some of these cemeteries and they're just locking them up. That takes us back to the game of hacky sack I was telling you about. The large rural cemeteries are mostly owned by companies who are still able to make money off of new burials. But as for the smaller ones, the ones that used to be on old church property or at the back of someone's house, If they don't have a local board to take care of them, the Randall, Steves, and Joes of the world, they're either left to rot or the municipality takes them over. And like Nicole said, they're often closing them up. And that's not helping our problem of limited burial space. That's what makes the Christchurch Memorial Garden, where I met Nicole, so special. Here, they were able to keep the cemetery active after the church burned down. And not just that, they turned it into a valuable piece of green space in a growing part of the city, a place where people can come to take a break after a long bike ride or walk through on their way to the train or the bus stop. It's a creative way to use burial space that still captures memory. I asked Nicole if she thinks all of our cemeteries will end up looking like the Richview Memorial Cemetery if we continue on at our current rate. I don't, I'm hopeful. I don't think, I don't think the ones that we have are going to be in a situation like the one in Richview 
the worst that can come from it would probably be that they'd be full. But I don't, I think that people want to be in these spaces. And I think they're going to want to advocate and fight for them more. The more that they can understand how, how important they are. And it's just going to take time. Yeah. And I hope in my lifetime, <laughs> when I'm 60 or 70 years old and I'm still kicking, <laughs> I can look back and say, wow, cemeteries have come a long way. Back at the Richview Memorial Cemetery, Randall isn't taking any new burial requests. He might make an exception if there's someone out there with family buried in the cemetery, but otherwise, it's inactive. The most activity that happens there is grass cutting. What do you think the future of the cemetery is? Well, I just think we want to maintain it and uh, care for it, basically. Forever? Yeah. In 2003, the cemetery was designated a heritage site by the province. This makes Randall's work to defend it a little easier. But he still has to stand up for it every now and then. Randall wasn't very forthcoming about why he's so committed to the work. But towards the end of our conversation, something dawned on me. And it, it's your legacy almost. Like, you know, this is work that you've done. It, you have a connection with your family. Yeah. Do you feel like it's your legacy? Yeah, I, I guess I do for it. Certain, yeah, at some points, yeah. Well, I don't know who would have done it if I hadn't hadn't uh, pursued it further, because I had an interest in it, right? So, why why are cemeteries so important to you? Well, I just like genealogy and local history, so I think pres preservation, because that's the, la the only thing that's left in that community. There maybe there's two other houses, but you never recognize them. So it's the last remaining fragment from that community is the cemetery. Today. Much of the world these people knew is gone. Their lives and the town they knew have been reduced to street and park names. The cemetery is one of the last remaining artifacts of a disappearing rural town. Do you think the people who are buried there, you know, before Toronto grew to what it is and Etobicoke grew to what it is today, do you think... Oh, they probably couldn't, they couldn't believe it, I'm sure. Right? They wouldn't, couldn't believe it. Do you think they're happy as to have that as their final resting place? Oh, I, have, I, I couldn't comment. I have no I idea. It. I don't know. Yeah, I guess that's just something that I wondered. You know, would they, are they, would they be happy there if they, if there was heaven and they're looking down? Well, they're probably surprised. We don't live forever. Things change. It sounds obvious. I know. But if we want to be remembered, and we want that memorialization to have meaning, then it's going to take planning. And planning means moving past our discomfort with death. I'm guilty of it too. Throughout the process of telling this story, I had been dissociating the conversation about cemeteries with actual people, family members, spouses, children, siblings even when others were reminding me of it. Maybe I was being insensitive, but I think it was a coping mechanism. I didn't want to talk about death, even when I was talking about cemeteries. But that changed during one of my last trips to the Richview Memorial Cemetery. It's like you want to feel a sense of peace, and when there is like a slight break in the cars, you, f you almost get it. But then an, a giant truck just whizzes by you and that piece is gone and you're minded. Oh yeah, if I walk too close to the fence, I could get hit by a car. Like, I, I don't know how strong the barriers are on the highway, but I would imagine if a truck came barreling through that it would end up in the cemetery. On the far end, there was the tomb of a little boy. In loving memory of George, I can't read his last name, only son of George and Isabel Nags. 
born looks like April 11th 1887 died looks like June 9th 1897 so he is just 10 <sighs> and then you can't make out the writing on the bottom This season on Paradigm. Myself and a friend will do the exact same thing. He'll get away with it, but I'll get yelled at. Your friend being non-black. Exactly. The old coal mining, it's a hard life. The dust was so thick, you couldn't see your hand with a headlight. <laughs> Maybe I am, am similarly assembled out of contradictions, like the wombat. You know, sometimes they have to choose between, like, paying rent or buying food. I was grieving that whole time. I just wanted her to have control. I've been to some of the most densely clustered multicultural places of the world, but Scarborough still tops those places. I feel like cancel culture is just, you've been cancelled, not allowed to do anything anymore, bye. These people still exist, like, what are they going to do now? Paradigm is presented by the Frequency Podcast Network. It is created by Annalisa Nielsen and me, Stephanie Phillips. I also wrote and produced this episode. Audio mix is by Ryan Clark. And a special thanks to Deepak Bidwai for research help. Thanks for listening. We'll see you here next week. And if you like the show, please do us a favor. Subscribe, rate, and review in your podcast player.